Okay, so thank you, Peter, for the invitation to join this event. Uh, I must say it's been so much fun hearing the stories and reliving memories that I, I have to say that 50 years later I, I had forgotten, including the prof's home beer, beer, which was totally disgusting and full of sediment. Um, but we had to say we liked it anyway. Uh, so I, I apologize if some of the, some of these slides are sort of repeats of especially of John's and, and in a way, Peter, I'm sort of illustrating your talk because uh, you'll see there's a few, some of my most vivid memories were of the toboggan mishaps of various ones. Um, can we get rid of that, I suppose? So this, this trip, like John had, had repeat that, it was life changing for me. It was an experience like, like none other. And uh, I also did a double major. I was biologically inclined and, and did zoology and geology and I wanted to work in fisheries, but uh, they told me there was no way in hell that they would, they would let a woman on the ship. So I decided to go to Antarctica instead. And uh, this was shortly after Peter arrived in, in New Zealand and uh, I bounced into his office and announced that I would like to go to Antarctica. And of course that opened a whole can of worms. And um, I, I am forever grateful to Prof Clark and Peter for all the hard work they did. I still to this day have no idea exactly what went on, but I know there were lots of, lots and lots of phone calls to Washington DC especially to the Navy and the various other people in charge. And um, hey, toll calls in those days were a big deal. So international toll calls especially. But in the end, I guess the, uh, the, the um, VXC-6, the US Navy did provided all the logistics. I think they weren't too keen on having this young female student in the field with a bunch of guys. And I, I, as I understand it, the final stumbling block was that the US Navy doctor was not allowed to treat a woman without another woman in the room. Uh, the way they got over that was quite creative. The leader of Scott Base, who was to be Brian Porter, he volunteered to be my father should the need arise. So there we go. So I, I applied, I got to go to um, Antarctica, which was, you know, I'd heard all, also about all these trips to Antarctica and it was something I really wanted to do. Uh, my project was in paleobotany, palynology of the Beacon Supergroup. I also, like John, you know sedimentology, though I did assist Peter and uh, did a lot of section measuring too. Uh, you, you know, you've already seen all the, um, the background on, on all the various people. Here we are in the ice cave, Peter, John, Rodney, Gavin, Barry, Alex, and David. And Scott Bass, as it was back in the 1970s. I won't show too many of these slides because I'm sure John in his video, and John, I'm very excited to see that later tonight, if I can stay awake till midnight, uh, <laughs> probably covers a lot of this. Anyway, we did the usual packing around Scott Bass. We did get to get up to Cape Royds to see the penguins on a um, shakedown trip and also enjoyed seeing the historic huts, which were quite amazing to actually be inside them. Uh, this was McMurdo back in 1970 on the sea ice coming back from our shakedown from Cape Royds. You can see the nuclear power station up on the hill that was still there then. They dismantled that not, not long after. They still had sled dogs at Scott Base that year. I think they disappeared soon after they took them back. Here we are loaded up on Willie's Field full of excitement with our four Polaris toboggans and our sleds, all our gear getting loaded. And I'm just gonna zip through these fairly fast. I think, can I move this? Yeah, I'll move that out of the way. Probably get this pointer up here. Okay, so we were working, as we've seen, and this maps up the other way from what you've been watching, uh, Skelton Neve and worked up here past Mount Feather, up past Bastion and down to the Darwin Mountains. 
rid of that. So here we are, we're put into the Skelton Neve, it's the Hurt C-130 taking off. Uh, clothes we wore, probably not too much different from what we, what you wear now. Um, some rather scrappy Vuai equipment, uh, mostly wool pants and, and long johns and, and um, sweaters, and also a lot of the DSIR equipment. And I'm sure the tents and the food will be covered by John and his, his um, video. So here we are on the Skelton Neve, ready to take off with our four toboggans and all our gear. It's the Portal Ice Falls behind. Uh, we're heading off to Mount Mitchell. And as you've heard from Peter, it was a, yes, it took, I don't know, don't remember how many hours I was reading the immediate report the other day and was quite shocked at some of the details. But anyway, here are the Sistrugi and you've heard from John and Peter about the sleds breaking and the, the bargains breaking. We spent a lot of time waiting around for things to be fixed. We went to Mount Mitchell, which was a sort of landmark there uh, for the first three days, I think, and worked on the, the fish beds in the Aztec. Uh, there was a little bit of, of Mitchell tillite and some uh, coal, Permian coal measures there. And of course, David and Rodney worked on the dolerite. And we headed off up towards the boomerang range. More problems. And it's just as well there were good mechanics because with us but, um, who did the best they could with the tools and the equipment they had, but uh, I sure didn't know anything about motors and how they worked. And so things went from bad to worse. At least the weather was a little, little better that day. And this is in the, um, up on the, I think on the end of Alligator Ridge. This is the Warren range that you've just seen. We're measuring sections up here, Rodney and David took off around the back and camped there for a few days and worked there. This is our camp out there. This is Alligator Ridge, very aptly named. Here's our camp. We worked here for a few days. I must admit that I really was intrigued with these wind scoops. They're spectacular. It just shows the power of the wind. Here it is, here we are looking over towards the Warren Range while measuring up through the, the Aztec. And I must say, John, these were the, the most beautiful rocks that we saw down there, the Aztec siltstone that you worked on. There's John. More Aztec. Here's Alex looking at the uh, fish fossil on one of the sandstone ledges. Some of the fish, which you've seen before, I think this, this diagram is from John's book, the Bothrylepis and Palaeoniscid fish. And uh, well uh, coal measures at the bottom of this uh, wind scoop. And uh, yes, that wind we were talking about, here, here we are on the boomerang range looking over towards the Royal Societies at all the blue ice and the wind getting up in the middle of the night to shovel on more snow on the flaps and uh, working in the wind, which was not fun. And it, this sort of slide sort of reminded me, we would tend to, or at least I did, I would remember all the good parts and forget the bad parts and then want to go to Antarctica again. And I'd get down there and start working in these sorts of conditions and wonder what on earth I had. What was I thinking coming back? here we are, we had been down to worked on Mount Ritchie or Mount Condescending as I prefer. Uh, coming back, more toboggan troubles. Here you see, you can, um, the, the runner has broken. The, this is the gas tank, it's the back of the seat tied on with rope. We used to spend time standing on the runner with our finger on the, on the accelerator button here when that had broken, here's the throttle here or Gavin rigged his own system. And then, yes, this was the final straw. We had to abandon a couple out on the, on the Neve and called up for a pickup. We, I think those were transported by helicopter back to our base camp and then they were picked up on, on uh, C-130 and taken back to Scott Base. So at this point, the um, Herc left, uh, David and 
Rodney and John headed off to Allen Hills and Gavin and Alex and Peter and I were left here working. We were going to work on first Mount Portal or Portal Mountain actually it is. We experienced the usual number of blizzards being snowed in, dig out and, and more wind. This is sort of interesting because it looks over towards, this is Mount Portal, this is the portal, this a big slope up here that we traveled up later. And this is Mount Feather for those of you who know that area. Anyway, we decided to pack up and move to Portal Mountain and made a camp at the base of the mountain here. This is the Aztec. We started working. They were working, Alex and Gavin, on the fish fossils. I think that might have been where uh, they found the Paleoniscid fish. Uh, Gavin, in a calm moment, reading Steinbeck's The, um, the Winter of Our Discontent, mm. which seems appropriate. <laughs> uh, we celebrated in the middle of measuring sections here, celebrated Christmas Day. Uh, is the Weller coal measures, the really nice um, semi-anthracite coal. They were fairly, fairly um, high rank because of the dolerite, which I'll mention again in a moment. Uh, so these were some of the, I didn't actually work on the silicified wood, but this is a nice tree trunk here. Some of the glossopterous leaves that I collected and, and did a little bit of work on. And the Triassic, those were Permian. These are Triassic Dichrodium. Uh, I think this is from Horseshoe, and this one was from um, on our last day, I believe, at Shapeless Mountain. But I was more interested in working on the polynomorphs from these fine grain siltstone and um, mudstone sediments. So I'll show this slide just out of interest uh, to point out this, I think, was from a, pre, uh, from a subsequent trip to Rotunda. Uh, and this is the Devonian Taylor group, but you can see the dolerite cells here, more dolerite all through these areas. So of course, dolerite it is the bane of my existence. Sorry, David, about that, but um, it bakes the my um, pollen and spores to uh, to a crisp. These are some of the better ones I've found. So this is what I have spent my whole career doing, and I'm still, as much as my eyes allow, still doing a little bit of work. Uh, after much playing around with uh, hydrochloric acid, hydrofluoric acid, fuming nitrate, and various other very nasty substances to separate the polynomorphs out. This, I had to add this one, this was the very first spore I found. It was actually from the Lashley at um, Horseshoe Mountain. So there was giant excitement when I actually found some. Most of the material I worked through because of the dolerite, it was highly metamorphosed and many of, especially in the Permian rocks, the um, pollen and spores were baked to a crisp, black and barely, if that, recognizable. So for those of you, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with palynology, but it's, it's, it has a great many uses. Uh, it can be used to interpret past vegetation and from that the climate and obviously the further back in time we go uh, the more speculative uh, it is we can um, determine for the uh, I did a lot of consulting work at one point in my life um, determined thermal maturation of the rocks for the uh, petroleum companies uh, I was especially interested in the age of sedimentary rocks and various other um, uses for palynomorphs right up to modern palynomorphs and forensic palynology. But this just out of interest shows a really nice, this is a well-preserved Nothophagus or Southern beach pollen from the Eocene of Seymour Island. The material from Cape Roberts and Andrew was even nicer than that. So when they first produced in a plant, pollen and spores are a, a translucent, very light yellow color. This shows two early Cretaceous from um, the South Shetland Islands. It's the same spore, the same species, but you can see distinctly different colors and that just shows this one has been cooked a little more. This is um, the pollen grain of uh, dichrodium. That's what that looks like. And, uh, Glossopterous pollen actually looks very similar, only it, they have striations across here. 
So this was the start of, uh, I did my um, PhD thesis mainly on this. Peter was my um, supervisor along with Paul Valor. And so this was the start of my whole career. And as I said, I have worked in this ever since. Uh, top of Portal Mountain uh, the, that um, Peter and I ended up measuring the rest of this. And um, just pause here on the top of Portal Mountain. This is looking south towards Mount Mitchell. By now, you can probably surmise that I had totally fallen in love with Antarctica and went back many times. All the trips, or most of them, the Vuai ones were sort of similar, but most of the other trips were very different, all very different and um, all fascinating in their own way. Uh, this trip has to have been the best of all of them. Though I must admit that it was probably also the hardest and also the most exhausting. Uh, speaking of exhausting, this, act, this day, Peter and I, I was looking in the immediate report and noticed that it, we actually spent 19 hours on the outcrop measuring this final part of the section. What I remember of this is being totally exhausted, heading back down, post holing through hip deep soft snow to the motor toboggan to then go all the way back down to camp and wondering if I would ever make it. I do uh, as well. <laughs> oh, sorry, I couldn't hear what you were saying. I, I, I was thinking just the same thing as I was watching uh, the, the summit area of Portland Mountain. It was a long <laughs> go. <laughs> yes, and you had much longer legs than you, and I was always struggling along behind you. <laughs> you did amazingly well. <laughs> well, thank you. Anyway, we did move. Uh, this is Gavin. Ale Alex is taking a snooze on the back of the sled here. Uh, up the portal, we, we were ferrying the sledges up. We had two toboggans left at this point, and one one decided that it, it wasn't going to go any further. We had to leave it at camp. So we had one toboggan that we went up the portal and along the top, which luckily was pretty smooth going, as you can see here, that's Mount Feather there. We traveled up to the Lashley Mountains and Mount Crean and did some work there. This is a pretty nice crevasse field on the south end of Crean. And uh, just a map. I, I had to do it, I had to include a map from the infamous Green Book. Here we are on the Skelton Neve where we went south down here to the Boomerang Range, then traveled up the portal up to Lashley Mountains and Crean. Uh, then we traveled back down to the um, base camp and were picked up by Herc and uh, went up to Horseshoe Mountain and we worked up there, uh, went up to Dearborn, ended up in Mistake Peak and Shapeless, and did, but did a lot of work around Mount Fleming and Horseshoe Mountain. Oops. And one of the things uh, then I remember of this part of the trip that I think it was somewhat warmer and we had a lot of trouble with a lot of snow covering the outcrop. We, there were some places which we, where we couldn't measure any sections because they were totally snow covered and a lot of whiteouts. Here we are traveling back following our, uh, from somewhere, following our um, tracks. Uh, and I show this too. This part of the trip, Scott Base had given us two new toboggans. So we had um, two snow tricks and they had different, different motors in them. And I have to mention this because that sort of has a bearing on, on as Peter's already mentioned, the, the um, the almost toboggan disaster in um, the Darwin Mountains. So we were headed back to Scott Base and then went down to the Darwin Mountains, which I have to say is the perhaps the most spectacular area I've ever worked on. So we will put in, this is this inset here, an island arena here. We did some work down here, but there was an awful lot of blue ice. We traveled up around 30 miles up to a camp here and worked in this area around the Heatherton Glacier. But first I want to mention my women driving story. We were put in, it was uh, Peter, Seamus, Kareen, Gavin and myself. 
uh, in that trip, we actually had, uh, I don't remember his name, but the, the um, vice chancellor of Vic had come along to see his party being put into the field. So I was helping unload and the usual noise of the, of the Hercules and all the engine going, that's no excuse, but <laughs> unbeknownst to me, they had done some work on the motor toboggans. We had two different snow tracks and a Polaris and one of the snow tracks, they had done some work on the, um, the drivetrain or the motor and, and changed some things around because they were pretty light and flimsy and uh, not very good for towing heavy sleds, which the Polaris had been fabulous at. Anyway, I'm, I'm standing on the runner of this toboggan, driving it down the ramp to take it off. And this is my side of the story. I don't know whether this is true or not, Peter, but this is how I remember it that I pulled back on the throttle thinking it was, I was breaking it and they had changed it from the usual pull back to and forward to, to accelerate. So I yanked the thing back and it took off down the glacier and throw me on, threw me on the ground. And this was an extremely bad moment because here we were losing one of our three precious toboggans all under the eye of the vice chancellor, I might add. So I, I, pro I, almost cried at that point. I'm sure Peter probably did cry. But anyway, it all worked out after the after the um, Herc left. We followed the tracks down the glacier and there it was, engine still running and it tipped on its side and it certainly did, deserved a victory dance at that point. <laughs> so we were lucky. Maybe one of the sources of our luckiness is, is um, our very Irish Seamus Corrine from DSIR who came with us. He said he always carried the luck of the Irish on his shoulder. Anyway, this, this is, um, we did some work along uh, near Island Arena at Coliseum Ridge and um, oh, Haskell Ridge and some of those areas. Beautiful outcrops. This is Devonian sandstone and the Darwin tillite up here. I did get one good sample out of there. And this is this is a place that I particularly remember. It doesn't look like much. It's a little dolerite dike. But I remember sitting down with my back on this nice sun warmed dike, writing notes in my field notebook, and fell sound asleep just sitting there writing notes and left a pencil sleep down the page. I guess I was a little tired at that time. This is taken on the 30 miles up around the Darwin Glacier and, and down to our campsite next to the Heatherton Glacier. It was rather hazardous and a few crevasses, but a spectacular campsite, I have to say. This is looking over the Heatherton Glacier. This is mostly dolerite massif on the other side. And this is that campsite from out further. You can see it here with the toboggan tracks down here. The next slide show, is taken at the bottom of that icefall. We had toboggan troubles there too. The Polaris broke and, and then the other uh, snow trek broke and we had one left. So we had the Herc come and pick us up. We had a couple of camp changes here, but uh, they actually landed on the shelf up here. It was a rather hairy landing. Um, I think it was about two miles further this way, but not the not the most desirable Herc landing place. Is the bottom of that ice fall. We did lots of climbing there, lots of climbing up around over Dolorite to get to the outcrop. And here we are with probably mixed emotions. Happy to be going home, relief that we survived and somewhat bittersweet that it's the end of the season. So anyway, um, this trip was just the start of, of so much for so many of us, for all of us probably, and certainly for me. And I have to say my heartfelt thanks, Peter, for your guidance, inspiration and patience. You put up with a lot from us, I'm sure, your knowledge and humor. And man, I've been reading that um, annual review. And when I look at the last 50, 50 plus years, it's truly amazing what you and all the folks here at Antarctic Research Center and the geology, I guess it's geoscience department now, have built and accompanied. So I hope that will continue. Uh, and thank you.
<laughs> yeah, thank you, Rosie. That's uh, wonderful to see and uh, just uh, feel very grateful and lucky to have um, worked with so many good people and uh, we just like it to continue. So um, I'm just thinking, Dave, would you like to um, say a few words now? Because you, I know you've written some wonderful stories that you've sent through to us, but uh, I think it'd be nice to have a few minutes, if you felt like it, to uh, reflect. Oh, thanks, Peter. Um, and let's just let me say to, to John, Rosie, and, and Barry, um, it is effectively, you know, 60 years flashing by, one's whole life is flashing by. And it's, I mean, we've got to keep in mind, you know, whatever audience we have, I mean, they may have some questions that uh, they could mm -hmm. offer but maybe I could try and almost sort of formulate these sort of questions. I mean, um, as a youngster sitting in the in, the, in an audience uh, 60 years ago, I mean, did New Zealand actually prepare us for Antarctica? Well, my answer would be no. Um, did, did Antarctica prepare us for the world? I would say yes. Um, when I look through this group, I see Barry um, and Rosie and John and myself. None of us spent most of our professional career in New Zealand. We finished up sort of taking on the world. And if there's a message to the youngsters in the, in the, in the audience is that um, a lot of Kiwis, as you know, are probably spending time outside New Zealand, maybe thinking about trying to get back into New Zealand, but uh, a very large proportion of us finished up somewhere else. Um, and so sort of coming back to this idea of, of um, does, does actually New Zealand prepare us for the world? Well, certainly, I don't think it does, uh, but certainly Vue did sort of prepare me for the world having spent most of my professional career in Africa, another part of Gondwana, um, covered with sand and covered with jungle and covered with townships, uh, very different from, uh, from Antarctica. But certainly uh, without Vue, um, providing that conduit for, for people at the start of their careers um, to go to a fascinating place which is, you know, 90% of geological time is, is, is actually recorded in these huge uh, continental masses. So, Peter, um, yeah, look, I was, uh, I was a young kid, made a lot of mistakes, but I learned from them. And uh, I think the main message from Vue was just to keep on um, a challenging career and, and forget about the fear of failure. <clears throat> So if Thank there's you. some questions from the rest of the team, I'll be, be willing to participate further. Thanks. Okay, Peter. look, th thank you, Dave. Uh, a couple of thoughts. One is that uh, we've been rather unfair to you, the audience, and you might like to have something that you would like to say. And I'm mindful of um, Harry Keyes and Aaron, who are also online there. And although they weren't in July 15, uh, they were in Antarctica, and I know Harry himself uh, continued his PhD much longer than he should have, that I should have let him, because he just liked going there. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Harry. But, uh, but would someone else uh, like to have a reflection or two? Well, it's been great. Uh, thanks, everyone, for sharing all those, those memories. Uh, my first trip down there in 1997, I felt like I've just got the tail end of that that era. Things, I think, uh, have changed a lot since then. Peter and I were talking about this the other day, and it's quite a different 
different vibe, different feel. But in the late 1990s, the steep field camps, I uh, went to Allen Hills with Peter and lots of stories. I'm seeing um, a lot of my own experiences reflected in stuff that had come before me. And I teach a, a course here now on Antarctica, everything about Antarctica. So we do the geology, we do the biology, environmental management, uh, arts, Antarctic Treaty, the whole lot. It's a general course for science and non-science students. So a lot of you, I think, would be pleased to know that the samples uh, that you brought back and some of this history is included in that course. In fact, we get all of the old gear out and the old Vuai yellow jackets <laughs> and mucklug boots. We get the students to, uh, to dress up in it. It's all hands-on. We get them to plan uh, an imaginary trip out to Allen Hills. Uh, trying to make the point that it's planning, planning, planning. Years of planning goes into the, the final trip out there. And, you know, I'm able to relate my own experiences, but I get in lots of people from the Antarctic Research Centre to talk about their experience as well. And the students love it. They respond very well to that course, gets great reviews. And I think people love seeing the place and hearing about the experiences. They love that there's such a long um a productive connection between Victoria and Antarctica. So I hope that course continues on. We actually even made a, um, uh, an online version where I went to Antarctica with Rebecca Priestley and we filmed lectures in Antarctica and we offered this thing as a, as a MOOC, a massive open online course. 6,000 people from around the world watched that course. Wow. And um, so communicating the, the history, communicating uh, the science. So I just want to let you know that uh, that aspect of it is still very much ingrained in, in some of the teaching that we do. Thanks all. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kay. Yes, this, this is being recorded. And it also, uh, I need to remind you that uh, we will be uh, gathering again to uh, hear a presentation at six o'clock, uh, which Barry will introduce John to talk about his video of what Antarctica looked like uh, in the 1970s. And after that, we'll go to dinner. And if you'd like to go to dinner with us, let me know. So um, any other comments? Is uh, anything from Harry? That's okay. We'll catch up. All right. <laughs> Thank you. I'll close things for the moment. And uh, thank you very much for coming and sharing uh, life 50 years ago.